Hello everybody, Warren Newsome, Real Estate 38 and the Handy Group coming to you from our location in downtown Willow Glen. Uh, today we'd like to share some information with you. A lot of questions that we get from our agents and our clients uh, always come up over and over again. So what we try to do is become a resource and I've got some great people here with us today that are going to share some of the answers to those questions that you might be having. So first of all, I'm going to start with Zay and he's going to give you a little introduction about himself. So thank you so much Warren and hello. Uh, so what we do here, we are a real estate firm, residential real estate. We help clients with selling and buying. Uh, we've been uh, practicing real estate here for about, I mean, between Warren and myself and a few of the other partners, over a hundred years combined, we work as a team. Uh, so we are very client-centric in terms of service, providing education. My nickname is the Data Guy. I like data. It tells the truth. It doesn't, you know change the story in any way or direction that you would like to take it or anyone else does. So we like to give a lot of education to the client so they can make an informed decision. Great. Thanks. Uh, we also have uh, our legal friends here today. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Samita Basu. I'm um, one of the partners and co-founders of Norton Basu LLP. We are a Bay Area headquartered uh, state planning and probate law firm. We have offices in Southern California and throughout the Bay Area, and we're very happy to be here today. Thank you very much. Good to have you. I'm the other partner and co-founder of Norton Basu LLP. Um, as Samita said, offices here, also down in LA in Beverly Hills, and thank you so much for having us today. Wonderful. Thank you guys very much. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into some questions that have been given to us, uh, get some answers to some of the things that are on your mind and some of the things that we've been working with as well. All right? So here we go. Uh, I'm going to start out with you, Zay. In this market, we deal with a lot of different age groups. Right now, it seems like the millennials are the ones that are really just taking over the market. Yes. Uh, what are you seeing out there, and what do you think is going on with these millennials? Well, the market has certainly has shifted. Uh, I remember 18 years ago, Gen Xers were very active in purchasing. Uh, so to give you a, a reference, in 2021 today, so Gen Xers are between the age group of 41 to 55, Millennials are 40 and younger down to 23. But the true active Millennials in the market, as you refer to them, are between the age groups of 28 to 40 that are truly active. So even within that category, it's divided into two. There's the early Millennials, 35 to 40, and there's the late Millennial, that's the 28 to 34. So what's interesting in their age group today, I have never seen that a younger generation between 28 to, to 34 seeking a backyard, seeking a larger property, seeking 2,000 square feet, 2,000 square feet for the Bay Area, that's a large property. On average, you start to notice it's between 1,200 to 14. So I came in into the market at that age group much smaller. So usually that age group earned quite a bit of money. They're techies, right? Uh, they've gone out of college. Uh, you see someone that's being offered a package, whether it be from Canada, East Coast in America, or overseas, whether it be the Asian continent. You're offered two hundred thousand dollars as your first job. So, and of course, RSUs are a company in that. So, this job market tech is is changing everything. So they're able to actually buy what they want to buy without having the restrictions of income and down payment. Yeah, we're starting to see a lot of that, and, and they're, they're so different in the way that they want their properties. In the past, it was all about, you know, I want to be able to live, eat, sleep, visit my friends, all in this one small community, and now it seems like they're really looking for, you know, having kids, having a backyard, and, and maybe COVID had something to do with that a It did bit. accelerate that. In fact, New York Times published this article, and it says, late millennials came in our market two years too soon. Yeah. So based on their, the older generation that have purchased real estate, at that age group, again, they weren't seeking that product yet, but working from home, we've had a client that was living in San Francisco, working in San Francisco, paying $4,000 for a one bedroom apartment that was very small. They bought a house in Tahoe, 
and they are working from home for the San Francisco Valley. So this COVID did shift this movement of people seeking outwards, seeking the suburbs, again, the backyard, yes, COVID certainly did play an effect in that. Great, that's great information. So let's get into ways of holding title. Um, can you give us some information about the best way to hold title? Sure, so in California, far and away your best bet is to hold title in your revocable living trust. Um, that is the way to guarantee not having to go through probate. Um, short of that, you know, California also has community property, community property with right of survivorship. Um, that would be the next best way to hold title. There's um, some extra benefits that are allotted to you as uh, a spouse in California if you hold title that way. However, the caveat to that, as well as just regular joint tenancy, is that if something happens to both of you or to the surviving spouse, uh, you're going to end up in probate. So it can be sort of a stopgap. Um, when the first spouse dies, you may be able to avoid probate, but eventually you're going to have to pay the piper. So the only way to avoid that is by holding title in the name of your vocable living trust. Um, as real estate agents, we don't give the advice of how to hold title. That's not in our scope of business, but what we do is we refer it out to legal people to you know, work with your CPAs or your attorneys to figure out the best way to hold title. Um, a lot of the questions that I get is about probate. Can you tell us a little bit about probate? So probate is a process in the state of California whereby the court looks at all of the assets of a particular, of the person who died, um, determines um, if, they, if they had a will, if the will is valid, and then um, gathers all the assets, looks at all the assets, assigns a value to all of them, um, is in charge of paying out the debts, any debts that the decedent had, and then distribute everything, distributing whatever's left. That would be distributed either per the terms of that person's will, if they had a valid will, or based on California law, which is based on blood relatives. Right. So that is a court process um, that is relatively lengthy mm -hmm. and pretty bureaucratic. We're gonna go into a segment about equity over time. Equity over time, holding property, uh, can be very confusing to a lot of people. Um, what Dave does in his presentation is presents a wonderful graph that shows you how the process has gone over time, how equity has increased over time. There's always ebb and flows in this type of thing, and people always ask us, are we in for a crash? Can you elaborate a little bit on the chart and are we in for that crash? Is that is the number one question <laughs> right now that we answer the most. Um, I want you to look at it this way. It costs 6% on average. You talk to different brokers, it may go down, it may go up, but on average, it's about 6% to a seller. In the past 12 months, we have seen 17% appreciation. So if you're in trouble and you need to sell a property, can you sell a property at a profit? Absolutely, simple math, 11% growth, and you could even get your 20% down payment. So that's why you're not seeing any foreclosures. The government, the banks, everybody learned from their 2008 mistakes. Right? We do not want to go back there, and they did not want to go back there either. That's why the forbearance was put in place. That's why all that money was printed from the government to actually save this economy. So as we move forward through this to say, all right, well, we had a recession, but we didn't have a housing crisis. We had an inventory crisis. Right? Everybody started to buy 25% migration from San Francisco, as I alluded to earlier, to buy literally go from Walnut Creek down to Morgan Hill. Anywhere where there was transportation back to the city, they went and actually overpopulated. Well, the inventory is very limited, so the properties that are sold are being sold by our parents. Well, to me, I have two parents, both of them are baby boom generation. So the baby boom generation is living longer due to uh, medicine and all the technology that's put in place to long life so they're holding on to their properties so now you have Gen Xers and Millennials that are coming in in Bay Area is not building any more backyards so a lot of families are seeking that backyard whether you have that 0.5 child whether a cat or a dog or actually children 2.5 right that's the American average so you have that everybody seeking the backyard and we're not building more of that we're building more of that cookie cutter type sardine living condos and townhouses but in the past 50 years, when we look at data, you can mind this. Uh, for the past 50 years, every 10, we have doubled. 
we have doubled in price if you're in Santa Clara County. I'm in Santa Clara County, so you are, you're right. Yeah. So we're not talking about New York. Okay. We're not talking about DC. We're just simply talking about Bay Area. Uh, so we double every 10 years. But what's interesting about those 10 years, not every year within a 10 is positive. So we'll share this graph with you. But if you look at 2018 and 19, we had two flat years. So of course, the graph went up and down. So if you bought at the peak, you had a heart attack as it dropped because, oh my God, 2008 was all too soon. So everybody thought that recession equals housing crisis. That's not true. If we go back to 2001 and 1991, both recession times, but we didn't go down in pricing. In fact, it was just had a law. So depending on what month you bought, you paid a little bit more and it, came, it dropped a little bit and we came back up. So I remember our consumer, especially the sophisticated consumer that were VPs, that were executives, that were CEOs, they all said, don't change job, don't buy a high-end property. In hindsight, it was the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. 2019 was the best time to buy. In fact, in August was about the flat, that floor before we jumped out. Mm -hmm. So in terms of values, every 10 years we double up, but we always have a two to three year long. So from the law, that's when we see the double. Now, I'm not promising that the next <laughs> so five, I don't know. Crystal, crystal ball, crystal ball. Say, I'm okay. just looking at data. Okay. I'm just analyzing the data, and the data says this is way too similar right now. In 2012, we saw a 25% appreciation between the sec third and the fourth quarter of 2020, and the first and the second quarter of 2021 represented 25% appreciation. Wow. So I'm just saying that data is too similar. After the flat, there's the jump. Are we going to see that? So you have uh, Goldman Sachs. I follow Zellman and Associates, so if you guys really want to analyze real estate data, follow Zellman. Uh, you have NAR and also the Bankers Association. They're all saying 2021, 22, it's supposed to have about 16 to 18% growth. Right. Now, we, will we see that? Possibly. The interest rate is constantly going up and down. So I, I'm a believer. I just bought something. So I... I'm an investor, I like to flip homes. So I analyze this data a lot. I just don't see us getting out of this inventory crisis, the mess we're in, the supply chain issues, the sardine type living. A lot of the people did go outwards, but now they're coming back. We're, we are seeing some slowdowns in Texas, in Sacramento, in a lot of these areas where Bay Area money left to go there. Now they're coming back. They're saying, okay, maybe I don't need to go there because my company's saying, I want you to come back. So we'll see how this is all going to shake out. But I think if the jobs continue to be here, we're not going anywhere. Like this 10-year cycle, it's going to be here. So Are you ladies seeing uh, you know, people redoing their estate planning and, and changing the way that they've been going about things? Have you seen a, a big shift, or is it still pretty part of the course for what you're doing? Uh, I think right now you're seeing a lot of people take advantage of the fact that you can streamline a lot of estate planning. Uh, the federal you know, exemption amount was so high, um, and California follows that. So I think you've got a lot of people that are taking advantage of making life easier for their successor trustees when the time comes, um, and taking advantage of removing some unnecessary complexity um, that may come back in in a few years, depending on how everything shakes out. But um, I, I think it's great that people are deciding to revisit, uh, update, and amend, and, and just, again, make everything streamlined. Yeah, that's, you know, with the fact that we've gone through COVID and a lot of people have, you know, passed away, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people were rethinking about, you know, their children, their grandchildren, their legacies. Um, so making sure that you're putting those plans into place is very important, and we always want you to talk to the, the qualified people to do so, so make sure that you reach out on that behalf. Um, let's talk a little bit about revocable living trust. Um, what is a trust and who needs one? Well, a trust is a entity that you create with yourself. It's like a contract with yourself to create an entity to hold all of your assets. And the trust document itself lays out, you know, who your beneficiaries are, who are who's to manage the assets on your behalf if you're incapacitated or if you die. Um, and you can, it's a very flexible document. You can put in who gets what, you can put in conditions. Um, you can say distributions should be delayed to a certain age. There's a lot of things that you can do in your trust. The trust is a private document, so nobody, it's not filed with anybody. It's not 
presented to the court unless there's some litigation involving it. So the vast majority of trusts provide a lot of privacy. Right. So how do I decide who to put in charge of my trust? That's a good question. Um, okay. You need to be thinking about somebody that's you know financially literate um, and somebody that's responsible. Now they don't need to have the same you know level of understanding, of course, as we do. We're there to guide your successor trustee through the process, but at the very least, you want somebody who's proactive, who's going to meet with the attorneys and going to follow through with all of the tasks that are going to be assigned to them. Um, you know, we like to say we'll quarterback, but they still need to execute the place. So you've got to have somebody who can do that. And we have lots of conversations with our clients. You know, we get into the nitty gritty of family dynamics, right? Yeah. A lot of people want to pick their oldest child, but that might not be the best fit, right? right? And right. so you really need to think that through. Um, and then there's always pick options the of doing that's <laughs> the middle child, right? right, right. Um, and you know, you always have the option of looking at a corporate trustee, um, you know, through a bank or even okay. just a professional fiduciary. And right. so we walk our clients through all of those options you know, sit through those meetings with them, and then at the end of the day, figure out, you know, what makes the absolute most sense for that particular family. Right, and I think that is the key. Finding out exactly what works for that particular family. We had a long list of family members. My, my, my grandmother had nine children, right? And when they passed, it was like, okay, who's doing, who's taking yeah. this? So really, having that plan in place, and, and it's always about choosing the right person to make sure that your estate is managed properly. Yes. So, and again, I, I really learned just now that it doesn't have to be someone from the family. You can actually appoint someone. That's right. So that's really information that you know I didn't even know that I you know yeah. went back to. I mean, so, a lot of times, family, you know, family yeah. member might yeah. not make sense, yeah, right? We all person. we all know those family members, yeah, right? I, so I've seen a lot of situations <laughs> where it's put in the hands of the wrong person. So, that's right. You know, and, and that's what we want to avoid. That's why we're here today. Finding out the information, the people to talk to, understanding what your rights are, what your you know, what you're up against a lot of times when you're facing the courts and the probate courts. And, you know, we want to be one step ahead of all that stuff, right? And I think something to add to that, I personally have a trust, and you got to have one. But what you've set in place five years ago, financially, I've noticed that it's either have, you have gone forward, some of the people that you have set in place are no longer in the picture. Mm -hmm. So how often That's should we... Question change this trust, like amend it, I believe that's the mm -hmm. right terminology? Yeah, okay. that's right. That's a great question. How yeah. often do you think you should it, revisit it? It depends on everybody's personal situation, but you should look at it every year. Every, every year. year. Okay. You wow. should just take a look at it um, and say, okay, here are the people who I've named, here are the people who are you know, under my power of attorney, here's my successor trustees, here are my beneficiaries, has any of this changed? And it could be there's a life event that causes a change. You got married, you got divorced, you had a kid, you know, some, something like that. Or it could just be that, you know, you, this was your very best friend and now you no longer talk to them and you were giving them $50,000 and now you don't want to anymore. Yeah. So those right. things happen too. <laughs> yeah. So as your priorities change, you need to revisit that document. And too many people think that an estate plan is a one and done kind of document. But it's, it's not. not living, yeah. 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 It's a living, breathing document. <laughs> How so, so having a will, does that protect you instead of having a trust? I know someone told me once before, if you have a will, you're, you're good. But I heard later on that, you know what, a will isn't a one document fixes all. So no. how would you compare a will to, you know? A so a will is going to provide guidance in terms of how you want your assets distributed, right? Okay. So from that aspect, it is providing the same thing as a trust. Okay. However, the will does not avoid probate. Ah. The will just gives the court guidance as to where you want your assets distributed, to whom and how but you still have to go through the probate process in order to make that happen. I, I, I have asked that question so many times. I think this is the best answer. <laughs> the best answer. <laughs> it's the clearest yeah. answer yeah. I've heard. Because yes. people always go back to, oh, well, you gotta go through probate, and nobody wants to go through probate, trust no. me. So yes. if you can avoid it, make sure, even if you have a will, make sure you're talking to the right people to make sure that you're getting the answer that you need. Um, when you're in the stages of purchasing a home, how do you know what's the best fit for the client and where do you start them for? A lot of questions. A lot of questions. We ask a lot of questions. Uh, I always ask, what is the exit strategy? Mm -hmm. Even though they're saying, well, I'm 28 years old. I, I'm, I'm just starting. Yeah. It, it, so it, it always identifies the roadmap. And what's interesting, 
the younger buyer, they have a lot of energy, they can take a lot of risks, and they think they're going to buy this place and they will hold it forever. In fact, the average household or banks usually can collect most of the interest the first seven years. Okay. Why? Because we move the first seven exactly. years. Or we refinance the first seven years. Back to your point, whether you got to put it back in the trust. But we ask them some questions. We identify certain things where everybody thinks, for example, good areas where we'll appreciate more has to have good schools. Where we are sitting in Willow Glen. Willow Glen is one of the highest price per square foot. Why? Because it has a downtown, beautiful architecture, it's centrally located, but it's got horrible schools. So, no offense to anybody <laughs> that is going, but, but I'm just going based on numbers. If you go to greatschools.org and you compare apples to apples, you'll find Cupertino a lot better than uh, Willow Glen, but yet Willow Glen is still very expensive. So that doesn't equal that. So we give them a lot of education to help them understand that where, what, what are your top 10, let's see if we can find them, versus somebody that is coming near retirement. And there is a retirement community, a few retirement communities here in the Bay Area. Well, so we identify those and to see if that makes sense for them. One level home, no stairs. Do you really need to go from a 2400 to a 1900 square foot home, what if 1200 is enough for you, right? So it's not about going bigger. So that's why we come in as consultants more than this just sell a home and help you buy another home. So it's very important to ask these questions right. and to put a roadmap to say, hey, I'm not going anywhere. I will be your realtor for life. It's an old cliche, right? It but cliche. but no, true. we're not going anywhere. We're going to be there for you. I want you to call me every time something happens yeah. because we get to refer you to real professionals to get things done properly. So. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody is different. Everybody is different, and that's great information. Again, we are here as a resource, right? We want to be the resource for your real estate needs for life, okay? This sounds like a cliche, but it's absolutely, true. Yes. I don't care if you need a painter or a contractor or a roofer. Anyone. Anything that you need real estate related is what we're here for. It's a service. So I really like that answer. Uh, it's not one fits all. You know what I always say? What's that? We'll find you anything but a spouse. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want, but we just can't we get you that. Everything else we got for you. You're on your own in that case, right? Yes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about first-time buyers. Um, what do you suggest when you, when we're talking to our first-time buyers, what do you suggest we should say to them, or you know, besides referring them to you, what are some of the things, the boxes that they need to check? So um, a lot of first-time buyers we find um, tend not to be able to think about a, a subject like estate planning while they're looking for a house, thinking about renovations, making multiple bids, et cetera, it's not top of mind. We recommend that they actually have their estate plan done before they start looking. Oh, okay. So the trust is created so that when they close on their first house, they will take title in the name of their trust. Wow. And escrow will take care of that for them. So uh, that's we've had more clients come to us that way. Hmm. Um, before they actually own a property, they told us uh, we're looking to buy, but we want to get the, the trust done now right. so that we can take title in the name of the trust when the construction is finished or when you know I'm moving in or the sale is actually closing. And that's a very smart way to do it. Very good. How long does that take? So if I wanted to start the process, and I don't have, I barely have any assets, maybe some stocks, mm -hmm. and I'm buying this property. From start to finish, how long does it take? So, you know, we like to say it depends, right? <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Okay. You right. know, we move at the pace of our clients. So if you already have, you know, sort of done your homework, you have your assets in order, um, you know, you're not going to go dig through boxes of envelopes to figure out what you got and where it is. If that part has been done, you know, we've moved as quick as two weeks to get a state wow, plan okay. done. You know, That's fast. Finish. Yeah. So, you know, we love technology. Right. Um, we love all the virtual platforms. So we can, you know, be accessible for our clients. They don't have to come in. It's not, you know, snail mail. There's no paper. Um, most everything is virtual up until the time of the signing. So we can move quick. Um, and I, I thank you for asking that question because I think that's what stops people. They're yes. like, oh gosh, I don't want to do a six month process, you know, but it can be done, in, you know, in two weeks, a month. Uh, I would say the average is, is probably about six weeks for people to get it done if they're dragging their feet a little bit. Um, but, you know, we can move pretty quick. So that's, so, so that's great information for exactly. us to know as we're assisting the client. 
that they need to get this done if they really like the house. <laughs> yes. Right. And they're putting an offer on that house. In yes. This market. Okay, we have two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get it yes. on two weeks. Okay. Yes. And, and okay. in this market, you know, we're writing lots of offers. It's mm -hmm. a really high turnover. But if you're thinking about these things ahead of time, you can really set up a plan. It's kind of like the question, how long does it take me to get pre-approved for a home? It's like, well, do you have all your stuff in order? Are you ready to make that step? Mm -hmm. Or do we got to go back and clean up something on the credit report? Exactly. Or do we have to write a letter to someone to remove something? Right. So I think your answer is right on point. It really depends on the client, how well they're prepared, and how well they're taking advantage of their time. Right. So great answer. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say? speak to each other about. I mean, these questions are from our general public, from our people that we do business with, but I see that we're learning a lot from each other, mm -hmm. and information is, is king, right? So we're gonna take this and share it with our clients. I'm sure you're gonna share it with yours. If there's anything that you've seen or, or have been on your mind or wanted to ask one another, this is a perfect opportunity to do so. Would you like to go first? I certainly have a couple of questions. <laughs> go for it. Okay. The, one of the number one concern is was this trust written properly, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't really get to test it out until you pass. Okay. And by the time you're gone, you kind of can't go back and say, can you wake up and see if you <laughs> asked you this, mean this? Did you, did you mean this, you right? So, so how, how would you uh, assess that? Or right, so what I would say is when you're going through the process, no matter if it's with us or another estate planning attorney, I would echo what uh, you said when you were talking with your buyers, which is, you know, ask a lot of questions. So your attorney should be able to walk you through every single part of that estate plan. So if they won't do it, or they're being condescending, or they're making you feel like you know you're rushing. you're yeah they're rushing you like you're wasting their time, that's probably a sign that that's not somebody that you want to work with because they are not they're going to be the same way with your successor trustee who's going to have a lot of questions as well. Um, so I would ask a lot of questions. You know we like to provide a plain English summary memo with our estate plans that walks you through every single section of the trust in plain English. Um, of course, we also answer those questions, but that's what I would test with that attorney. Um, we also do reviews. So if you've got a estate plan and you're going, you know what, gosh, I don't want to talk to that attorney anymore, but I still don't know what's in here. We are happy to sit down, review it, and then say, here's what it says. Here's the issues we found. Here's what we would recommend. So we mm -hmm. do that a lot of times for clients who are in that situation. That's okay, great. Very good. Thank you so much. The second question, again, seller, it's in a trust. I can't find the trust. Yeah. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Just by the reaction, I can tell you've been <laughs> down there. It's painful for us, too. Yeah, yes. you know, uh, so we have to get escrow involved. Yeah. They'll yeah. have to do certain you know, certifications to make sure that person is truly that person. But still, nonetheless, how do you go about that? Well, that's a very good question. It happens um, a little bit more frequently than you would like uh, because, boxes, you know, right? yeah, yeah, it's in a box. It's, yeah, yeah. you know, somebody's hoarded it out right. of their garage or whatever. Um, so if you really can't find it and, you know, if the people who set it up are still alive, you have to do another one. Ooh, okay. So you can keep the same title, but you'd right. have to do a complete amendment, amendment okay. to the trust. It's a complete okay. restatement of the trust. You okay. can keep the same name and do a brand new document. And if the person has passed already, if both of the people who established the trust, the trustors, if they both passed, then we have to go to court. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so you have to have you have to this that document. document. Yeah. So what if you still have communications with that lawyer? Can that lawyer give you that document? If they've kept it. I mean, lawyers will have to keep it for at least five years. We have to okay. keep client files for five years. So um, potentially if you're within that window, they may have it. Um, the other thing is to potentially, when you get your estate plan done, we just recommend for all of our clients either to have us scan it and put it in the cloud and password Thank protect you. it, yes. or they can you know go do that themselves at FedEx or if they would like. But that is the new way, I think, to make sure that no matter where you are, you can access those documents. And so a copy is just as good as the original. So if you lose that entire binder, but you've scanned it, right? It's already been notarized and signed. You scan it, you print it all again from the cloud, good as new. Very good. That's good to know as well. All right. Well, I think that's going to conclude this portion of our segment. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, we're happy that you came and joined us today. Thank you so much thank for you. taking the time yeah. out of your busy days. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to Annie. She's wonderful. She makes sure that you guys are on point. Always love working with her. And Zay, thank you again for taking time out of your day. I know you're very busy. Um, and we'll look
forward to another segment sometime. Thank yes. you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.